Hello, I'm Dominic Cobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Mike Ashton, Senior Finance Executive, Insurance and Pensions at Gibraltar Finance, the government body that promotes Gibraltar as a financial services centre. Gibraltar has built a sterling reputation as a major insurance domicile, particularly in motor insurance. Mike assumed his present role in 2013 after 20 years in the London insurance. Ooh, better start that again. Sorry. Lloyd's not London. Well, London would be fine if you wanted to. It works as well. London. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. No, I'm going to have to start again. Well, now. Just, I've, 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 just, it. I've, I've buggered it up. Sorry. Just start um, it again. That's fine. I mean, it's still running and, and Sam will just edit out the beginning. Yeah, exactly. OK, perfect. All right. Hello, I'm Dominic Cobson, founder of Future of... <laughs> having a really bad day today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like I haven't done this before, is it? <laughs> OK. Yeah, off you go again. Right, ready, steady, go. Hello, I'm Dominic Cobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Mike Ashton, Senior Finance Executive, Insurance and Pensions at Gibraltar Finance, the government body that promotes Gibraltar as a financial services centre. Gibraltar has built a reputation as a major insurance domicile, particularly in motor insurance. Mike assumed his present role in 2013 after 20 years in the Lloyds insurance market. Mike, thanks for joining us. Dominic, it's an absolute pleasure. Good morning. Now, you look back over getting on for 30 years in the insurance business. Is the insurance industry a business ripe for sweeping technological change? Yes. I, I look, look, I think... If we think back on insurance and compare it with some of the other um, financial services sector, I think it's often referred to as the, the, the dinosaur of uh, financial services. And it has been slower, I think, than many other sectors to embrace technology. But what's been happening, I think, in, in over the last few years is there's been a real shift within the insurance market generally for companies to embrace technology to really try and drive down costs and to improve efficiency. And there are a number of insurers that have done that you know, extremely well. And I would sort of put some of Gibraltar's motor insurers absolutely in that class where they've been using technology for many years, leading edge technology, and have seen all the benefits of that te technology in the way they operate and run their businesses and the results that they have delivered to their um, shareholders. They're just Maybe I'll just say one, one quote I saw from um, Will um, Willis Towers Watson, which said that in 2020, there was 7.1 billion US dollars invested in insure tech businesses. So I think that gives you an indication of quite how much um, investment and focus is going into the insurance se sector to really bring it up to speed in terms of its technolog te technological innovation and the use of technology. So things are definitely happening in insurance and you have attracted some of those uh, insure techs to Gibraltar. I'm thinking here of, uh, of Zigo and Marshmallow. Those are two very high profile UK insure techs. They came to Gibraltar. Why did they come? I think um, if, if we look at where they originally started out, they were both looking at um, the motor insurance sector. And because over the last 20 years, Gibraltar has built up this sort of vibrant motor insurance sector, I think it was an obvious, um, an obvious step for them to look at, you know, when they were thinking about setting up an insurance company, which was the next sort of step of their evolution, they would have thought, no, where do we want to set up? You know, our market at the moment is, is, is focused on the UK. Uh, and therefore there was really only two choices in a post-Brexit world, either to set up an insurance company in the UK or to set one up in Gibraltar. And I think that Gibraltar sort of experienced over these last 20 years where a lot of new insurance companies have been established there. So our regulator is very used to, you know, to, to dealing with startup applications. And I think we'll probably touch on it, I'm sure, later in terms of um, Gibraltar as a fintech hub. But when you put those two together, I think that you know, really probably gave a very compelling um, reason for both of those businesses to take a really sort of um, you know, hard look at Gibraltar to see if Gibraltar could play a part in their overall strategy. And I think that was the reason that they then established their insurance um, companies in Gibraltar, whilst you know having a lot of operations in the UK, so it, it's it's um it's not that Gibraltar has sort of ha has a land grab and taken everything, you know a lot of their operations are based in the UK, but the insurance platform and the insurance company is very well suited to Gibraltar. Well, I'll, I'll come back in a minute to to why Gibraltar is a good base and that relationship with the UK. But before I do, 
can you give us some examples of other insure tech businesses which you've attracted to Gibraltar? I mentioned well, two of them. But. Yeah, there's um, I mean, there's a, 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 a sort of an, an MGA or an, a, a broker, an insurance intermediary called Hedgehog, which has been in Gibraltar for a number of years now. We there's also um, uh, an insurance company called Mulsanne, which has been in Gibraltar for quite a number of years. And that actually, beca- when um, Marshmallow started and they were you know, operating as a, an insurance intermediary in the UK, they needed to have um, an insurance company partner. And that insurance company partner was Malsan. So I think Malsan had, has obviously been looking at where it wanted to position itself for the future. And um, that business was acquired by some investors, London investors, in at the beginning of last year. And, and then earlier this year, they also announced that they were teaming up or acquiring a new insure tech business called Abakai. And Abakai has, has, has quite openly um, stated that it wants to be an insure tech leader in the UK. And so I think we're going to, what we'll see is that, um, um, and this is just from, you know, reading um, press, so this is nothing, no, no um, private information I'm disclosing here. But I think what we'll see is that Abakai using Malsan, the existing insurance company, we'll see that that business grow quite substantially. Their aspirations and the statements they've made would appear they're going to be a large insurance business. And I, and so my assumption is that that will be based around an insurance company in Gibraltar. So I think we're going to see um, that business growing quite considerably over the next few years. And, that business, and, and, then, and then Dominic, there's a number of others, which obviously I, I can't sort of disclose, but the FSC or the, 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 the GFSC, the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission, which is our independent regulator, is dealing with a number of insure tech applications at the moment. And we're hoping that as those applicants, you know, go through the process of being regulated, that we'll be able to announce some um, you know, new um, licenses in 2022. Am I right to think the name Abakai indicates they'll be using AI? Um, yes, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that's, you know, I think it's, that it really is a sort of, I know we, we, we'll, we're going to talk about that in more detail later, but I think that when we're talking about technology, I think you know the real drive in the insurance sector is around AI as opposed to maybe blockchain in, in other sectors. Not saying that, that, that blockchain isn't involved, but the, the, real, the real focus is around the implementation of, of AI within the insurance sector. Yeah, no, we will come back to that. But first, uh, you've touched upon this in a, in a number of different ways, but if I, if I said to you, could you give me the, the elevator pitch on why Gibraltar is a good base from which to... Uh, if you like, disrupt the, the insurance industry, what would you say? Well, I think, you know, a key thing is um, if we if we look at the, the motor sector, which is by far our largest sector, I mean, the uh, Gibraltar's insurance sector is heavily skewed towards motor insurance and, and therefore our regulator and the local financial um, profession, insurance professionals and, and support services, lawyers and accountants, they understand in, uh, motor insurance very well. And as that is a sector which is really seems to be, um, there's a lot, a huge amount of focus on um, bringing more AI into the motor insurance sector in the UK. It, it, I think that Gibraltar has this one, this which I've touched on a little bit, is this um, 20 years of experience of, of dealing with, with startup insurance companies. And at the same time, over the last five years, it's, it really has also um, developed into um, a, a, an international hub for um, distributed ledger technology businesses, um, so DLT or blockchain businesses. I think when you put those together, if you've got a regulator that understands technology and understands, you know, startup businesses, which is, um, we would say our USPs, I think, in, you know, has to be around speed to market um, and access to the regulator. As a small jurisdiction, if we're not able to act in a nimble way, then, you know, why would people come to Gibraltar? Um, you'd set, you'd stick probably in a, in a larger jurisdiction where maybe it's a little bit more, takes a little bit longer, not in all cases, but maybe it's longer to, to engage with a regulator. Whereas in Gibraltar, I think we tend to say, or I tend to say on behalf of the regulator, I think if, if a, a regulated entity is needs to see the regulator on an urgent basis, they can normally do so within 48 hours. But likewise, because it's a very small place, if the regulator needs to see the, the regulated entity, they can walk across town in 15 minutes and knock on their front door. So I think it's uh, that's, um, but I think it, it's that speed to market, um, obviously maintaining all of the right sort of regulatory uh, standards and and uh, and and and, uh, and and values, but at the same time having that ability to be able to engage on a regular basis. If you if you as an applicant 
you know, or as a, um, a regulated licensee, you, your business, you want to be nimble and you're opportunistic and you need to move quickly. So I think that there would be our, the key reasons for Gibraltar to be able to support the disruption of the, uh, the insurance sector. Now, one other strength Gibraltar has, and you have touched on this briefly, is, is the long-standing historic and commercial ties to the United Kingdom. You've just um, early last month signed an agreement, a statement of intent, I think it was called, with the InsureTech UK Trade Association. What's your expectations of that agreement? Yeah, I think we we reached out to InsureTech UK um, at the beginning of the summer and sort of said, look, you know, we've had this um, you know, a great start with both Zigo and Marshmallow and with other people starting to come and look at Gibraltar and, and, and to decide whether you know, Gibraltar would be a good fit for their businesses. And we were aware that, you know, the InsureTech UK had over 100 members. And we just thought there was, hopefully there was an opportunity for us to, one, just raise the profile of Gibraltar within that, that community, that membership. But secondly, to say to them that there are sort of two particular aspects which we felt could interest them. We felt that there, and, and that, that in many cases, those members may have absolutely no understanding or, or really uh, awareness of Gibraltar as an insurance domicile. And, and, and the reason I can, let me, if I just slightly, um, um, if I just go off slightly off piece, if we were to walk down a high street in the UK and to say to, and stop 10 people and say to them, look, you know, what do you think, do you have any idea about you know, Gibraltar as a motor insurance domicile? And they would probably, most people in a provincial high street would probably say, no, but no idea at all. I, you know, I thought it was, uh, you know, monkeys and, 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 the, and the, you know, the, the mouth of the Mediterranean. Whereas, you know, if we then ask those 10 people, look, could they show us their insurance policy in their glove box? We'd probably find that three out of 10 would have a Gibraltar motor insurance policy. So I think it's about sort of profile. And so we, we, so we said to um, insurance or InsurTech UK, Look, how about if we just start to engage with you and your membership to see if there are opportunities where Gibraltar could potentially be part of the solution that those businesses want? And if we take the bigger, um, bigger members, the, the, those insurtechs which have been they're using that te tech technology over a number of years um, with partners, with insurance partners, but are now thinking as Zigo and Marshmallow did, now is the time for us to consider establishing our own insurance company then we just wanted to make sure that Gibraltar was on that shopping list. So it wasn't just a, a sort of a, a, an immediate um, decision to set up in the UK, but there was at least an opportunity for us to present Gibraltar as the only alternative jurisdiction that has full passporting rights into the UK post-Brexit. Mm -hmm. And then for smaller insure techs, which maybe are still in that phase where they're just coming to the end of developing their technology or getting it ready to be used you know, in the insurance space, in the insurance market, where they would um, is, is normally set up a, a, some sort of insurance intermediary or something, or maybe uh, historically in the UK, some have set up as, as, um, as authorised representatives to say, look, there is an alternative, and that could be to set up as an MGA in Gibraltar, still having full passporting rights, still working with the insurance company partners that you were thinking of working with, but just again, have a look at Gibraltar to see if that would be a good alternative um, or to, to the UK. So that's really been the process and, and what we've been trying to establish with InsureTech U, UK. They've been in, incredibly supportive and we've got a number of events which will be rolling out. Um, the first one, I'm, I'm joining just an internal uh, discussion group um, later this month. And then we've got some other events which we're planning for 2022. You use the term MGA, Managing General Agent. Uh, how does that model work? I mean, that is effectively, the, an MGA is a type of insurance intermediary. And it, the, probably the best way I sort of describe it, it, it's an agent of the insurance company. So it, it takes the amount of, um, it, it, the operating parameters will be agreed with the insurance company, which is covering all the risk. But the, the MGAs, and they can vary in size from being, from being quite small to being very large, um, but they are underwriting and, and dealing with claims and administration of certain policies or classes of business on behalf of that insurer, but they're not writing on behalf of their own benefit, on their own balance sheet. You know, the risk and any risks that come are coming from the balance sheet of the insurance company. So it is an agent, but it's been a very successful, um, um, uh, I think, you know, um, say, uh, class of, of insurance um, entity over many years 
But in the last few years, particularly in the UK, with the establishment of the Managing General Agents Association, which now has also has over 100 members, and those members collectively write more than £6 billion of business, it's become more and more, I think, a, 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 an area where people can move into, into the insurance sector in a very nimble um, manner. And, uh, and it's been very successful. And we, and we would like to attract more of those MGAs to Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there structures, vehicles in Gibraltar, I've noticed, for example, your protected cell company structure that's available. Are there other corporate structures, if I can use that term, that are likely to interest insurers around the world in Gibraltar as a, as a location? I think that one of the things that um, we have is, um, and I don't know if this is a, a, a good time to just talk a little bit about the, the regulatory access that Gibraltar has to the UK, because if I can explain that, if that's yeah. if, if good. So um, because Gibraltar joined the EU along with the UK in 1973, we, um, we, we've had this sort of privileged position where the UK, after the, the, the Brexit referendum in 2016, said that it would continue to offer Gibraltar financial services firms, including our, our insurance sector, the ability to passport into the UK. And what we found actually that after that referendum, the government did quite a detailed survey, is that whereas we've been sort of positioning ourselves as a gateway to the EU, in fact, over 90% of Gibraltar's financial services business was actually with the UK. So it was sort of good and bad. It was bad that we hadn't actually made greater inroads into continental Europe than, than maybe we thought or we'd hoped. But at the same time, it meant that it was very obvious that our focus for the future was on the UK. And, and the UK government has worked you know, uh, very closely with the Gibraltar government and, and with the regulators. And um, they have came up with a, a new regime called the Gibraltar Authorization Regime, which um, went through parliament, um, started its route through the UK parliament about this time last year, and then gained Queen's or, or Royal Assent in, uh, in um, the end of April this year. And that set out very clearly how Gibraltar will be able to passport into the UK in the future. That hasn't come into effect yet, but it will be coming in. There's some statutory instruments which um, provide for access in, in this intervening period. But one of the key things is that Gibraltar had to commit to um, um, regulatory alignment with the UK. Absolutely. So we, we are, as the UK changes any its regulations within the insurance sector, Gibraltar is going to follow um, pretty much in, you know, in step with, with that. I mean, they'll, they'll, of course, there'll be a room for, I'm sure, for a little bit of flexibility, but effectively, we have abs committed 100% to regulatory alignment with the UK. So what does that mean in terms of doing anything with the UK? Then obviously anything we do from Gibraltar with the UK, there's going to be regulatory alignment. What the UK has said, though, if we're dealing with other parts of the world, which don't touch on the UK, so we have no footprint in the UK, then we have the freedom to do other things. So one of the things that we could look at as an example would be maybe to look at a dual captive regime where we would say our current captive regime is Solvency II compliant and fits in with all of the Solvency II requirements. But maybe if we were looking at um, a new captive regime as an example, which was looking at say international programs, property programs, for example, then if, if, that, if, that, if that new class doesn't touch the UK, then we've got the ability to innovate and to do things differently. So I think we're, we're looking at opportunities where we can innovate. I think, but probably our, our greater focus is in saying to other parts of the world, if you're looking to do business in the UK, then Gibraltar is an option as a stepping stone to doing business. Again. You don't have to set up directly in the UK. You could look at Gibraltar as an alternative. I think that is, is our greatest focus at this time. And does this create a division of responsibility on the regulatory side, or is it very simple that, that the, the UK operations of an insurer based in Gibraltar are, are regulated by the FCA and the Gibraltar operations are, are regulated by the FSC? Is there a kind of cooperation between the FCA and the FSC or is it a complete division of, no, yeah, think, division of labour? No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. So if, if it's a Gibraltar entity, uh, either an insurance intermediary, which could be an, M, an MGA or an insurance company, then that those businesses are regulated by the by the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission. Most of these businesses, a lot of our current you know, insurance companies and groups of, will have um, FCA regulated entities in the UK. And one of the and along with um, alignment under this GAR, this Gibraltar authorization team, is another commitment to absolute cooperation. So there is very regular and open dialogue between the regulators 
And, and also um, in terms of Gibraltar insurance companies, there's also a dialogue with, with um, our regulator, with the PRA as well. And because there is, there is one sort of, over, um, a sort of overriding requirement or, or sort of agreement that if a Gibraltar motor insurer has got to such a size where it potentially represents systemic risk to the UK motor insurance sector, then of course the UK does take an interest in that. So that's why it's very important that there is absolute cooperation, absolute transparency, and that no individual company can in some way maybe leverage a, one part of its, of its organization to the detriment of another through um, either regulatory arbitrage or, or any other sort of financial arbitrage. So these things are very important and, and we have to ensure that everything we do is consistent you know, with the UK, and is uh, in terms of you know our regulator alignment. As as you've explained, the the UK has guaranteed Gibraltar access to to the UK insurance market. Uh, you've also talked about about the MGA model and how that how that works. In terms of day to day operations, how do these Gibraltar insurers work with the the underwriters in particular back in in the UK? Well, I mean, if if you are an MGA. Then you know you you can if you you may it's quite likely that you would have one or two of those insurance companies that you partner with will be in the UK, and therefore you'll be dealing with those underwriters under the terms of the agreement that you have with that particular mm. insurance company, and and the underwriting um, risks are going to be uh, um, basically placed from that UK insurance company, and therefore all of all of that information and all the regulatory requirements around that will stay in. In the UK, if you're a Gibraltar insurance company, then you know mind and management and physical presence has to take place in Gibraltar, and therefore underwriting, you know, the underwriting has to take place equally in Gibraltar. Now, of course, there'll be some classes of business and and certain types of business where, as we move particularly into you know greater you know techno technological involvement, where things are being done by algorithms and and, and matrices, and I suppose then you know you're saying well. Where is that taking place, and how is that how is that working? But essentially, you know, if it's a Gibraltar insurance company, the underwriting and claims management has to take place in Gibraltar. Now, Brexit. You brought up Brexit uh, and the relationship with the UK. The UK financial services industry as a whole is in this kind of limbo uh, in relation to to the EU. It's a kind of unresolved element of of, of Brexit so far. What does that uncertainty mean for Gibraltar? I think we're actually in exactly the same position. You know, we left the the EU on, on the, the same time as the EU, as the same as the UK, and we've lost all our access to the EU in exactly the same in the same way. As I sort of mentioned earlier, in fact, Gibraltar's foot European footprint wasn't that great, and in the four years, you know, the four years since the, following the referendum, I think most of those Gibraltar insurers that did have a, a, a footprint in the UK either decided that they would continue writing that business and therefore they sought to set up an alternative structure within the EU, or they looked at um, potentially just you know, letting that business go and just refocusing all of their activity on the UK market. There was a number of, we you touched a little bit earlier about um, um, protected cell companies, and there was some transfer of cells from Gibraltar to Malta and from Malta to Gibraltar because those cells have really what in maybe some of those Gibraltar cells have been focused on the European Union and some of those Maltese cells have been focused on the UK. So the owners and, and sponsors of those cells, well, actually, they needed to change their domicile. Um, the only other sort of, I suppose, really interesting aspect for Gibraltar is that, you know, we have this land border with Spain. And, and I think that in those, in, during those four years, there were a number of discussions with the Spanish insurance regulator about whether it would be a possibility for some of those Gibraltar insurers to set up a, a, a subsidiary insurance company just over the border in, in, in La Linea. I think those discussions were, you know, were very open and, and very positive, but nothing happened in that regard. But what's been happening in the last year is discussions between the UK government and the EU on behalf of Spain and, and, uh, and, and Gibraltar about Gibraltar joining the Schengen zone. And those discussions are ongoing at the moment. And I think that the, the, the target is still to see if there can be agreement by the end of this year. Um, my own personal view is that looks like, I think it, that may well um, extend a bit longer. But if that was to happen, then that would you know, create a rather um, interesting scenario, whereas Gibraltar would be outside the EU, 
but it would be in the in within the Schengen zone, and that would make movement to and from you know Gibraltar and into Spain even easier. And maybe that sort of model that I talked about that it could be attractive for someone, maybe say for a new insure tech that actually has aspirations to be a pan-European business, potentially they could set up in Gibraltar and start underwriting the UK. And they could say, well, look, actually, maybe we could set up our European hub just across the border. And so there would be the opportunity for you know, workers to move between different offices at different times of the day or week. And you could get some really, maybe some quite um, good um, administrative um, you know, um, gains and, and, uh, and um, I'm thinking of the word now, but uh, opportunities in terms of, uh, of, of running those two businesses quite separately in terms of regulatory, but using uh, expertise and, and skills across both um, insurance companies. But maybe that won't, um, that won't come about, but it's, it's an option. Well, people often forget, I think, that there is this tremendous traffic every day, isn't there, across, across the border. Lots of people living in Spain come to work in, in Gibraltar. And You're right. Vice versa as well. So, I mean, quite apart from that interesting idea of Gibraltar becoming part of the the, the Schengen group, prompts me to ask you whether Brexit created labour problems for you. I don't know whether this is a general problem in, in in Gibraltar or not. That attracting the kind of talent you need to drive the businesses which you're looking to create in Gibraltar as a as a financial. Do you is that a is is that an issue? Attracting talent. I think. Um... There's, as you said, about 15,000 people cross the border on a, on a daily basis from Spain to work in, in Gibraltar. Many of those are, are local Spaniards, but there's also a whole host of, of other nationalities who work in, in the financial services sector across different sectors. And in particular, we have a very large um, online you know, gambling sector employing more than three and a half thousand people. And a lot of those people, um, you know, they come from all over the world. And, uh, and, and many of those choose to live just over the border in Spain. So I think that um, I think the Schengen, this, this, if the Schengen agreement, I think for businesses on both sides of the border, and I think for, and I think it seems to me for, you know, really as a generalization for both communities are very keen to see that happen because I think it would actually attract, you know, it, it would certainly ensure that Gibraltar has, can attract, um, you know, the workers and, and, and the skill sets it needs. But at the same time, you know, those people, if they're living in Spain, they're supporting that economy, spending their money there. And so it has, you know, it, it works um, for both economies and it's important for both. And I think if the whole of this area can just, you know, increase in prosperity, then that can only be a very good thing. So, but I think you're right. I think um, like everything, you know, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of competition in these sectors and therefore attracting the right people is, you know, um, is all, you know, can be a challenge. And if you, but if you can offer them you know, a greater freedom in where they want to locate and live in terms of their home life and their work life, then I think that can only be a benefit. Uh, you, you've, you've described the problems that, that Brexit created for Gibraltar. They didn't appear to be very large. 90% of the business was in UK insofar as there were uh, issues of access. Um, cells were able to move between Malta and Gibraltar. So um, it clearly hasn't created unmanageable problems for you. But have you had the insurers Based in Gibraltar, start to think about the opportunities it, it, that, that Brexit creates for them, and I'm thinking here of things like attracting more foreign business, greater tax or legal or or regulatory flexibility. Or is, you know, this is only five and a bit years ago. Is it is it is it too soon for that to, to become apparent? I think um, well, um, earlier this year, um, Gibraltar raised its it, its corporation tax rate from ten percent to twelve and a half percent. So it's now equivalent with Ireland. And that's as, as, a, as I think as, as in terms of what's going on with these discussions around the OECD and, and, sort of, and, and you know, basic um, rates of corporate tax. But our, our tax rate is still, um, it's, a low, it's a low corporate tax rate, and I think it's still attractive. Um, but I think that the, the real opportunity for us is, is, to, is to sort of try to attract some of the other businesses which we've, we, we've looked at, at sort of diversifying, not diluting what we have in terms of the motor insurance sector, but looking to try to diversify. And we've had some success, but maybe not the success that I personally would have liked. Um, but I think there is an opportunity over the next few years for Gibraltar to develop in other areas. So the, the compelling reasons that I think that we would say why motor insurers have been so successful in, in operating from Gibraltar can be equally applied to other classes of non-life insurance. And, um, and some of our insurers do in fact have, you know, um, you know, right, a number of different classes of business, but we are still very skewed around, uh, as I said earlier, around the motor insurance sector. There is one applicant which I'm aware of, which is looking to 
uh, to, to gain a license next year to start underwriting at the beginning of 2023. And I think they're coming with a much broader multi-line approach to the classes of business they want to write from Gibraltar, using all the same sort of attributes and, 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 and reasons that um, our motor insurers have, have found so, uh, so advantageous. And I think if we start to see that, I think there's also opportunities around reinsurance. And there's, there's no reason why Gibraltar can't compete apart from a very different profile with some of the other much larger reinsurance sectors. And we have had one or two um, case studies which we can, you know, we can refer to where people set up and, and did very well within a captive insurance company structure, but it was effectively um, a reinsurance structure. And again, on the life side, you know, I, you know, I think there's real opportunities for Gibraltar to look to attract uh, more life companies. We have a very small life sector at the moment. Um, I think for the same way that um, you know, Gibraltar has built up this sort of uh, um, profile around motor insurance, other sectors have built it up around life insurance. But I think in the future, there's an opportunity for us to, to really to, to build on what we have, to diversify and to uh, attract other types of insurance operators. I'm going to ask you in a minute how helpful it would be if the UK started to diverge from EU regulation of the industry. But before I do, can I just dispose of one uh, issue, which is you, you mentioned Gibraltar raised its corporation tax rate from 10 to 12 and a half. Uh, is tax incentivization uh, part of the sales pitch of Gibraltar to insurance companies to you know come here or not? You haven't emphasized it. No, from from my perspective, it's very much a, you know it's a nice to have. It's a secondary consideration. I think that if the if the fundamental business reasons for coming to Gibraltar are not satisfied, then then just coming for tax, in in my opinion, makes absolutely no commercial sense. But I think, it, I think, but what it does do is if, if those fundamental reasons for setting up in Gibraltar, which we've spoken about, you know, those compelling USPs, if, they're, if they work for that applicant, then I think it's then the, the, the tax is, is um, a good thing. I think what we're going, obviously going to see is with this, for the larger insurers, which are parts of groups where, as I understand it, that they have more than, they're writing more than 750 million euros of business, then we're going to see this sort of equalization in any event where you know, a minimum tax is going to come in, into play. So I think that um, yeah, tax is, of course, it's consideration, but I don't think it's a driving force for, it, um, for anyone in today. Maybe 20 years ago, when we had exempt and non-exempt companies, it would have been a different argument. But today, I don't think it's a driving factor, but it's a nice to have you know, because it, there is a differential um, between Gibraltar and many other jurisdictions. We're still a low, a low tax jurisdiction. Yeah. You, you said earlier that one of the benefits of coming to Gibraltar is you can see the regulator within, within 48 hours. My question is whether the United Kingdom, having left the EU, creates the opportunity for the UK to diverge from the European regulations as it adhered to over the last 50 years or so. Have you thought about whether... And when the UK starts to evolve away from the way the EU is regulated insurance industry, that would have advantages for Gibraltar and attracting business from other parts of the world? I think yes. Uh, and I think that, um, that the, the UK has already sort of started. There's been a number of, I think, sort of, you know, fairly sort of minor, but sort of announcements. The ABI in particular, I think, has been, has been working closely with the UK government over certain aspects of, of Solvency II, which right. I think there's a general feeling or certain, certain quarters that some of those requirements were there for some of the large continental insurers and never re and were always a bit of a hindrance from, from a UK perspective. So I think we're going to see some of those changes taking place and being brought in. I, at the moment, I'm not expecting to see, you know, a, a sudden, you know, a rapid change, but Gibraltar effectively will follow through. Where I think maybe there's an opportunity is some, is some of the changes that we could see or the opportunities we could see that maybe we can also share those with the UK government and say, look, actually, we think this would be good for us, but we also think it would be good for you as well if we were to, you know, to just slightly start to diverge in, in some areas. And I think there's, a, 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 you know, um, some areas that we've sort of looked at and thought about, which we thought, well, look, if that worked well for Gibraltar, it would also work well for um, the UK. And this is not about sort of the lowest common denominator. This is just about making some in some cases, sort of relatively minor changes, but just giving greater flexibility and maybe just effectively providing, 
you know, a structure that the market's looking for, rather than something which may have been in place within the EU for over 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago, and is now maybe not quite so um, relevant to today's market. Insolvency too is anything but minor, though. It's a, it's a huge cost and capital capital cost imposition on the industry, isn't it? So that I'm sure would be a welcome. It is. Well, I think that, um, and the UK has, I mean, has always been, um, I think, has always taken a view that um, rather than just having a minimum of solvency too, they always expected you know, UK insurance companies to have a, a really decent buffer over and above their solvency to you know, the minimum requirements, both you know, the minimum capital requirement and the solvency capital. They, they expected in UK insurers to have a, a really decent buffer. And what Gibraltar has done over the last four years is to say to all of our insurance you know, companies, um, look, you've got to have a similar type of buffer to the UK. You know, this is where we're moving. We're moving to regulatory alignment. And there was an interesting article about a couple of months ago with some analysis of the, the sort of the, these additional buffers or margins that are being carried by, you know, by the UK insurers and by Gibraltar insurers. And they were really suggesting, this is not my analysis, they're suggesting that that, that differential, whereas it was probably, you know, quite, um, you know, w- w- there, was, there was quite a difference a number of years ago, that's almost disappeared. And I think what that has done as well is that, you know, that if the, some of the smaller Gibraltar insurers, which um, have, uh, you know, didn't have that financial wherewithal, have either had to, uh, you know, find new um, backers to in, inject more capital into those businesses, or they've effectively uh, stopped underwriting. So um, I think that is um, an important aspect, that, but I, I don't see the UK wanting to in any way dilute the position it's in because it's, uh, and therefore, you know, in Gibraltar, we know we're going to be uh, in exactly that same position. So we're not, look, although it's, 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 as you said, it's, it's, it's complex and, and costly, mm-hmm. but in terms of the policyholders, that's where we need to be to protect policyholders. So any changes to solvency too are not about uh, a more liberal capital regime at all. They're about changes at the margin, what type of things insurers can invest in and so on. Is that right? I think, I think there are certain changes that, you know, that, that the UK is looking to do, but I don't, um, in terms of, uh, I think, particularly on the life side, I think I've you know, seen certain aspects, but I think these are, 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 have been thought about you know, in, a, in a very um, careful and, and, uh, and you know, conservative manner. And I don't think it's like a, there's, there's going to be like a, a mad rush to suddenly, you know, reduce all of our capital requirements. I, but, you know, I could be wrong, but that's just the, the impression I get is it's still going to be about making sure that in terms of uh, UK policyholders that they're dealing with, you know, the best of breed in terms of and, and strong insurance entities when they're buying their insurance policies, be that individual, uh, you know, consumers or, or, or companies and firms. OK, so. The capital ratio of, a, of an insurance company in Gibraltar will, will follow the UK model. But just in, in, could I clear one thing up? If an insurance company comes to Gibraltar, how much substance do they have to have in Gibraltar? You've touched on this a bit earlier, but just to be absolutely clear about it, so what, they, what do you need to bring? So today you have to meet, you still have to meet the solvency two requirements. So mm-hmm. absolutely, so you have, to, you have your minimum capital requirement and you have your solvency capital requirement. And that solvency capital plan will be based on the business plan for the first you know, few years of operation. So you've got to be able to show this is your business plan. This is how much you're expecting to write within the first few years of your business. And then you've got to have capital to meet all of the, the expected and, and um, extrapolated you know, solvency requirements of that business. And then on top of that, there's going to be a buffer. And that buffer is, is you know, the, the regulator will determine that buffer. But that buffer is going to be you know, quite you know, substantive. And it's going to be in line with, you know, the the average sort of buffers that the UK are looking to that the UK ha- you know maintains. So it's 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 going to be, and it, I, so it's difficult for me to give it absolute. I can tell you what the the minimum capital requirement is because that's a, a min, an absolute minimum of, of three point seven million euros. But I don't think any insurance company starting today is going to be able to operate on that level. It's going to be then the solvency capital requirement and then the buffer, and uh, and depending on the class of business. Um, that will also have an impact as well, but it, it's it's a it's not an easy it's not an easy process. You know, you've got to show that you have the financial substance to be able to operate that business. You know, in a in a in a market where you know rates um, could change and, and claims could come about in those early years, and you have you know you have this, the financial um, you know wherewithal and and, and uh, strength to be able to deal with any anything that uh, occurs in those uh, in those early years. 
we were having this conversation slightly back to front, but could we talk a little bit about the history of, of, of the insurance industry um, in, in Gibraltar? How did Gibraltar build up this position? You mentioned, for example, that Gibraltar built this very strong position in UK motor insurance. Now, it, it occurred to me that perhaps this was a result of, I remember my cars always used to be insured at Lloyd's, <laughs> but it seemed to be any more. Um, was that a res- direct result of the problems at Lloyd's in the 1990s? Was Gibraltar able to attract business on the back of that, those difficulties? Okay. Yeah, or what there, happened? There, was a two, I think there were two um, sort of independent events, which I think really led to, led to this. And the, as you're absolutely right. I think the first was that the Lloyd's market was a, a very strong motor insurance um, market when there were, uh, uh, you know, quite a, a number of uh, syndicates which specialised in motor business, well, a, a lot. And I can't remember the, the, the number now off the top of my head, but it was, you know, it was, it was a, a big sector of, of the market and they were focused on the UK market. But I think that in the 90s, as Lloyd's went through its problems and had to effectively um, you know, reconstruct the whole way that capital came into the market, those motor insurers or those motor syndicates were saying, look, the costs of us operating in Lloyd's are very high. And it was very difficult to compete with the UK um, composites, which were also offering motor insurance. And then if you then, the problems that Lloyd's had, you know, they had to, they, there's a whole host of levies that Lloyd's imposed on, on the syndicates. Those motor insurers were effectively saying, look, we're having to, we're paying all these levies, but we were never part of the problem. Those problems emanated from, you know, latent disease and asbestosis and all other parts of the world. But, and yet we're still paying for that and we're still, uh, and it's just too expensive for us. So I think they started to say, should we come out of the Lloyd's market? Should we set up as independent insurance companies in the UK? And as I understand, they went to the old FSA and said, look, how long would it take us to set up a number of them? And they were told, look, between 18 and and, and 24 months. And then at exactly the same time, Gibraltar's ability to passport its financial services throughout the EU was clarified by what's called the Gibraltar Order, which is a piece of UK government legislation that was and published and passed in 2001. And that effectively gave the, the framework for today's passporting. And so I imagine a, a bright lawyer in the city must have thought, look, I've just read about Gibraltar getting this, the, the Gibraltar order and passporting. Why don't we go down and talk with the Gibraltar insurance regulator? And at that stage, there were a number of uh, insurers in Gibraltar servicing the local market, but also captives, which have been around for quite a number of years, but, um, but you know, a relatively small, um, number of insurers. It wasn't anything like the number we have today. And I think when they went down and the, and the regulars said, yes, yes you, know, you could set up here. Um, our, our standard, our, 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 our um, service level agreements were around about six months to set up a new insurance company and they were to set up. So I think that was really the key thing. It was, and that led to the likes of today um, uh, Advantage, which is part of the Hastings Group, which is now part of uh, a large Finnish insurance group. And Admiral um, and uh, the Zenith companies, or Zenith and Market Study, which are now part of Cataree, all of those very large insurance companies there in Gibraltar, all setting up very early in, in 2001, 2003, and those, and a host of others as well, which set up in those early years. And I think taking advantage of the fact that there was now a very clear um, um, framework for those businesses to passport into the UK. Mm-hmm. So, major insurance is. is- a dominant line of business for the Gibraltar insurance industry. Um, what other lines do you do you specialize in? Well, uh, we have a we have a, a captive um, insurance sector as well, um, and some of and we have um, some PCCs operating, which are in some ways are offering are offering like mini captives or micro captives within those cells. We have um, um, some life insurance companies, which tend to be focused more around offering. Um, policies for the pensions industry or the offshore pensions industry. We have one um, uh, insurance company that is focused on legacy insurance business. So it's buying legacy books of business from other insurance companies and then running those off in Gibraltar. And then our insurance companies themselves, those motor insurance have started to branch out and diversify. So a number of them are writing what I told you know, home, home insurance or home, homeowners insurance. A number of them are writing pet insurance. Others are writing um, a whole you know, range of, of, of classes. But when we, if we sort of distill and, and, and analyze, it's still those key motor um, classes which make up the vast majority of our business. 
And do you regard yourselves as, you've mentioned this, you know, some centres specialise in life, some specialise in motor, some specialise in property and so on. Do you regard yourselves as being in competition with other insurance centres, whether that's uh, Bermuda or Malta, or does this specialisation mean that, in fact, you don't really go after the same sorts of business at all? I I think at the moment, um, I think, you know, well, pre-Brexit, there was definitely um, competition with Malta. I think, you know, Gibraltar and Malta, were, they're, they're, they were sort of competitive jurisdictions, absolutely. I think Bermuda is, is, is a, a much larger um, insurance sector. It has historically been, and it still is, a, a massive reinsurance centre, whereas Gibraltar hasn't been able to uh, generate, um, you know, a, a large footprint as a, as a reinsurance um, domicile to date. And so I don't see we're necessarily, we're competing with, with Bermuda. In terms of the... The, the sort of crown dependencies, the Isle of Man and uh, Guernsey, which are the two main insurance. I suppose there is a degree of a de- degree of competition there, um, but they don't have our passporting rights. So where it would be, it would probably be around the captive sector. But because Gibraltar captives today have to be solvency to compliant, then we would tend to attract you know, larger captives. Not that they don't. I mean, both those jurors also have very large captives, but maybe larger captives historically that wanted access to Europe or where the minimum solvency requirement was not really um, so important because the, the amount of capital they would be carrying in any event meant that they would be well above that minimum capital. So uh, whereas for smaller captives, then Guernsey and the Isle of Man have always been more attractive because the level of capital they need is much lower than setting up in Gibraltar. So I think, and with Brexit now, I think that the division between Gibraltar and Malta is very clear. And so forth, I think any... Yeah, that historic competition has really disappeared from the beginning of this year. Mm-hmm. Now, major insurance is, a, is an interesting uh, line of insurance to be uh, to have a large position in because it's always had this high technology component starting uh, with the telephone. I think back in the in the nineteen eighties, we're now seeing people. This is really a prelude to asking you about how excited you are or how excited your colleagues in Gibraltar are about applying both AI and machine learning, but also blockchain to uh, opportunities and, and problems in, in the insurance industry. What are you kind of, what are your the insurance companies you host in the motor industry learning or teaching the rest of the industry about applying AI and blockchain to, to the insurance industry? If I, if I um, cause I think um, in terms of blockchain, um, Gibraltar's built up a, a really, a, a very high profile around blockchain for DLT providers. So people who are using um, you know, the blockchain or the dis- distributed ledger technology. Um, and what we did in, in 2018, at the very beginning, to, we became the first jurisdiction worldwide to introduce really quite a, a detailed regulatory framework for businesses using the blockchain. And what we meant by that is that if you were using the blockchain to store or transfer value on behalf of a third party, you had to be regulated. And what we found is in, in, in looking at it for the previous four, three or four years is that there was a real... Um, appetite from these new technology companies to be regulated, but no one really wanted to provide that regulatory framework for them. And it wasn't just the management of those businesses, it was in many cases the investors wanted to see that. And and, and many customers as well wanted to know that 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 business they were dealing with on a day-to-day basis was working within a regulatory uh, um, environment. And so that's attracted a lot. But in, in my mind at the moment, whilst there are applications, blockchain applications in the insurance sector, there have been, there's a number of, um, of successful ones going on at the moment. The, the focus and the amount of uh, um, investment is going into AI. So I think AI is, is very much where we see, so although we have this a very you know, vibrant blockchain sector, I think for the future in terms of technology is, a, is much more in the insurance sector around AI at the moment than in blockchain. So our thoughts there is that if we can attract these businesses that are very focused on AI and bringing in these techniques um, and this technology that will one, support our insurance sector as well, but will bring in new competitors and, 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 and provide greater choice to um, you know, UK consumers, then that has to be a good thing. And that hopefully those businesses will be comfortable in looking at Gibraltar because of the fact that there is this sort of sitting to the side of it is this whole blockchain um, um, and, te- and fintech um, um, sector and, and uh, 
and, and, and all of those businesses which are you know coming and, and looking at Gibraltar and doing a whole lot of really innovative things. But so I think you're absolutely right. It's it's around AI. Our bigger insurers have used technology, as I said earlier, very effectively. And I suspect that they will continue to build on that technology and to introduce more AI. Some of the new entrants are taking a slightly different approach in terms, I think, if you just look at, say, if you ask them the number of people they had within their organization who are engineers, you know, um, computer engineers, they'd say, well, maybe 50% of our workforce are all engineers. So, and they're looking to bring in, you know, even more data than has, than has been the case historically. So a lot of third party data gets brought in and, and, and crunched in terms of rating and looking at you know, the, the risk they want to take. So I think it's, uh, it's a really exciting time and we would love to be, you know, uh, you know, be a real um, platform for those businesses to develop and to grow and to help you know, change and improve uh, the, the insurance sector. We spoke to uh, Albert Isola about the, the blockchain legal framework, which Gibraltar has put in place, which does give you, puts you in an unusually um, advantageous position. Uh, one or two other jurisdictions have done the same, but it's, it's still pretty unusual to have that, that in place already. And I can see why insurers are, are very attracted to, to AI. It's a business which could definitely be improved in terms of productivity and innovation by AI. But do you find when you're marketing Gibraltar in the UK, perhaps through InsureTech UK or what other events that you do, do you get a lot of interest from insurers and say, oh, you've got a, a blockchain legal framework in place that might be helpful to us because we are looking to use blockchain to, I don't know, share documentation with underwriters? It, 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 does it intrigue them or not? I, don't mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think what it gives us, it gives us credibility in the first instance. So I think that's really important because, it, you know, um, it gives us credibility as a as a tech savvy jurisdiction for for these people and you know, and the skill sets that they use. I, I'm sure in many cases they're they're pretty transferable between these different sort of the, the insure tech and the fintech sector. Um, so that that I think is is very important. There will undoubtedly be you know greater applica block applications with blockchain smart contracts, and I can see things like maybe on some of the inefficiencies around the. Uh, um, insurance linked securities where they would be, you know, I think dearly love to have, you know, smart contracts being used on a, on a very regular daily basis to sort of to deal with more transactions. And there's some people I know who are looking to do things in Gibraltar using platforms, using the blockchain, um, but they're not there yet. And, um, and whilst we would, you know, dearly love to be, you know, part of, of that process, at the moment, the focus is, um, is around more around AI. But you're absolutely right. You know, there, there has to be a role for um, smart contracts, you know, blockchain and the immutable um, 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 conditions and, and uh, that, that, that gives and, and the security that the blockchain will give in terms of, pe you know, people knowing that, you know, what has you know, what's happened can't be changed, effectively can't be changed. So or, and that may start off maybe around private blockchains to start with. Um, and then more into, into uh, you know, public blockchains. But at the moment, uh, the interest is, is focused around AI. Now, one uh, business which is very interested in blockchain at the moment is the funds industry. Uh, Gibraltar has a, a funds sector, quite a lively one. Um, you also have an online gaming uh, sector too. Are there synergies between what Gibraltar does in the insurance side and, and what it what's going on on the funds and, uh, and gaming side? And do you make efforts to, to search for and exploit those synergies? I know synergy is a word we use. And we ought to see more of them than we do, but uh, are there practical instances of these industries gaining from each other in Gibraltar? Yes, well, there's two things. On the, um, on the fund side, I'm aware of, uh, of one you know, applicant at the moment, that, or, or I, they're in a pre-application phase at the moment where they're looking at you know, an insurance platform, a new insurance platform, but in coordination with uh, having a funds license as well. So you're absolutely right. There's someone that's looking at that at the moment. In terms of the gaming industry, um, that is actually that same applicant is, is looking to sort of to work quite closely with the, the gaming sector um, or the gambling sector. And we have our, our success to date around insurance link securities has been one of our existing online, um, it's an online um, lottery where they wanted to uh, effectively um, um, place some of their risk into the ILS market and which they've done through, initially for the first few years through a Gibraltar PCC. 
And then that, that business went on to establish its own insurance company. And now it's taking risk off the, it's basically buying its risks through its own insurance company and still working with the ILS community on, on the, uh, on the collateralization of that risk. So, and we'd, and we'd love to do more of that as well. So we have actually have some experience now going back for about um, four or five years in terms of uh, a Gibraltar online gambling company working with local insurance um, operations and insurance entities. The, the most recent is, is one that it owns itself, but using risk transfer through its own entity. And, and we could certainly do more of that in the future. Final questions for you. Um, one of which is, we've talked about the historic ties to the to the UK, the the strong commercial relationships which sit in place. Ninety percent of your business being in the UK. But post Brexit, is Gibraltar now starting to look outside the UK, beyond Europe? Is it looking at other insurance markets? I'm I'm thinking here particularly of Asia, but I suppose I could also include. Uh, the Americas, particularly North America, that's a very mature market, probably an ex-growth market. Asia seems a very exciting place to be. Are these markets you're looking at as opportunities for Gibraltar? Well, pre the pandemic, we spent quite a lot of time in, in the Far East. And personally, I think I was in the Far East between 2016 and 2019, about 14 times. And we really felt, whilst it wasn't so much that we felt there, that our insurance entities were seeking to to write business in that region. What we were trying to look at is, were there ways that as that region continues to grow and, and take a, and become more and more important in terms of the, the world economy and the amount of you know, the financial strength it has, were there opportunities for Gibraltar to act as some sort of springboard, originally into the EU and then post-Brexit into the UK and saying, look, are there opportunities for, or for those businesses to set up in Gibraltar? And that could be, either for the UK or it could be for global business where they would just think, actually, we like the way that Gibraltar operates. We like the way that um, there's this sort of, this, the nimbleness and, and, the, and the speed to, to market. And, and maybe there's opportunities for us to set up some form of insurance entity in Gibraltar to look at some of our global risks. And I think, you know, and we were making sort of some, some quite good sort of progress to, and had lots of conversations. And I think, you know, the last two years has maybe there's been a slight reset, I think, in that with the pandemic. There's also been a sort of a, um, a you know, I think a reset in, in maybe the West relationship with certain parts of the, of, of the Far East, which, again, maybe makes that a little bit more complex at the moment. But undoubtedly, there has to be opportunities for Gibraltar to act as some form of conduit for other um, in, to, to access either the UK market or to be or to provide a platform for certain types of global insurance um, risks and, uh, and, and, and covering those risks. And do you have a clear vision? I, I don't know whether five years is the right time scale, whether it's 10 or it's 15, or even whether it's 20. Do you have a vision of what the, you would like, ideally, the Gibraltar insurance industry to look like? Is on whatever a, time, whatever on time a, scale you like. On a, on, a, on a personal basis, as opposed to on behalf of government. I mean, I'm sure, I mean government will, will be obviously very keen to see the the industry continued to grow, to diversify, and to um, increase in, and increase it, but, you know, the stability and strength of all of those businesses that operate. And I think on a personal basis, I would like to see absolutely all of, all of those same attributes. And, and, uh, but at the same time, I think, I think there is an opportunity for greater innovation. And I think around you know, technology, we, there really is a, a great um, um, potential for Gibraltar to be somewhere where people will come for a part of their solution. So they'll say, look, actually, we're operating in this market, we're doing this, and Gibraltar can't, doesn't, you know, can't offer us everything for a number of reasons, you know, just its size and, 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 and location doesn't mean that for everything. But there's a part of that jigsaw puzzle where Gibraltar has, you know, really, and I've said it a number of times, you know, really compelling reasons for people to look really deeply at, at Gibraltar and to set up part of that of their overall strategy in Gibraltar and, um, and, and to widen the businesses and the types of business that we do from Gibraltar. And I think there's absolutely no reason why we can't do that. You know, it's like so many things in life, you know, you tend to go where you know and where you feel comfortable and where there's been maybe a history. And so breaking into different sort of niches and markets can be quite tough and you have to be, uh, you know, quite um, inconsistent and, uh, and resilient in terms of, of going back to people and saying, look, 
have another look at Gibraltar, see what it could offer. And I, and I think, you know, we will see greater diversity um, and we will also see, um, you know, just a greater strength in our market because that's where we have to, you know, we have to move to offering even greater security in terms of the uh, policyholders. Uh, and they know that if they come to Gibraltar, they're getting an absolutely first class, um, um, a first class product and one that they can absolutely rely on. That's your, your personal vision. Can I ask you an even more personal question? Um, and I promise this is my last question. Um, you were in the London market for, for 20 plus years. You came to Gibraltar. What attracted you to Gibraltar? Well, in fact, I, in, in, I worked for one of the largest managing agents in the Lloyds market for 15 years. And uh, towards the end of that period, there was just a, a local Gibraltar insurance professional um, came into my office in, in uh in Leadenhall Street and said, look, I've got this great opportunity, you know, would the company I was working for at the time, would we be interested in, in setting that up? And we said, uh, we were sort of quite surprised. We said, yeah, actually, we liked it so much. We said, look, rather than just providing you with capacity, he wanted to be an MGA. We said, look, we'd like to take a 50-50 a, a, a 50, a 50 share with you. And that business is, is, was set up as, as a branch office of that large, um, uh, um, um, my, my, my employer, which was part of a large, um, uh, insurance group, international insurance group, and that business is still running today in Gibraltar. So I, I got to know Gibraltar in, in sort of 2000, 2001, because I became a, a director of, of that entity and I was traveling down on a regular basis. And then I actually took some time away from the insurance sector in 2002 for quite a number of years. Apart from in 2003, that same individual, and this is when what, some of those early stage motor insurers were setting up, phoned me up and said, look, would I be interested in being an early stage investor and a non-exec director of one of these motor insurers, which I did for, um, from 2003 to 2008. And therefore I sort of got to know people in Gibraltar because I was going down for board meetings. And which is why when the government was looking for, in 2012 for someone to help them um, you know, um, market and, and develop their insurance proposition, um, someone contacted me and said, would I be interested? And uh, I thought, well, it would be great to, you know, to, to spend more time in Gibraltar and, and uh, and so um, I was interviewed by the chief minister and uh, fortunately got the job. So uh, that's the, my sort of personal story in, in how I've been uh, you know, with the government for the last uh, eight years. The weather played no part in your decision. Well, of course, yeah, um, 320 days of, of sunshine is, yeah, is, is a bit tough, you know, and, and great golf over the border and, and sailing and a lovely lifestyle. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope lots of people come and join you.